Thanks. So I was asked to talk about a uh, fairly wide range of subjects from the, the future. I'll raise it up. How's that? Can you hear me in back? Good. Uh, so the future of uh, space exploration, a little bit about astronomy, uh, the relationship of humans and robots, that's a pretty big uh, chunk in just uh, a few minutes, but uh, let's start. First of all, uh, just to report that not only today is the Hubble Space Telescope well and good, but we fully expect it will be working tomorrow, which is what this is about, and the day after tomorrow, and for quite some time to come. Um, I did have the great privilege of being on the crew that rescued the Hubble telescope after those of you who are old enough and remember that when it was put into space, it did not focus properly. We put in the corrective optics. Some people refer to it as contact lenses. Actually, we did it all with mirrors, but the result was truly spectacular, and Hubble has gone on to revolutionary, or revolutionize our understanding of the universe. We've seen these spectacular pictures of the birth of stars, of the death of stars. I mean, these, these patterns here are not the work of some psychedelic artists. That's nature. That's the universe. Uh, and, and these things uh, are all around us. And Hubble has made these images uh, available to people throughout the world. It's also given us the ability to look back in time because with its sensitivity, we can see galaxies uh, billions of light years away, and that means that the light that is reaching us today left those galaxies when the universe was a much younger place. Um, this is the famous Hubble deep field picture made by pointing Hubble just in one small part of space, about what you would see through your fingers and just let it record to see what was there. This was a part of space that, for all other telescopes, was basically empty. You can look a few of these pictures. You can see those little crosshairs. Those are actually stars. Everything else you see in this picture is a galaxy, thousands of them. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. And in looking back, uh, we have seen that some of the early galaxies are much less well-formed than we see now. So we've actually been able to see back to the time in the universe when galaxies were being born. Hubble is not powerful enough to see the birth of the very first stars. That's something for tomorrow's astronomy and the Webb Space Telescope, which despite its difficulties, hopefully will be launched in another four or five years. This is much larger, even more sensitive than Hubble. Um, it, what, what we are doing in space astronomy is to take the state of the art of about 20 years ago and then move it up into space. Hubble is basically using the technology of the Palomar Telescope. Astronomers went on to develop the multi-mirror telescopes, and that's what Webb is uh, ultimately going to be. Just to give you some idea of the scale, this is a full-size model of the Webb telescope. Each of those sun shields that you see are the size of a tennis court. So this whole thing has to be folded up, the mirrors as well, in order to fit inside a rocket. And then we're going to put it a million miles the other side of the moon, and hopefully the whole thing is going to open up uh, properly. If not, maybe we'll go and fix it. I hope we don't have to do that. Uh, telescopes allow us to explore the universe passively. We just see the radiation that comes to us. But through our development of robotic probes, such as the uh, spectacular spirit and opportunity probes that have been working on Mars for the last eight or so years, we can actually interact not on a personal basis, but at least robotically with uh, extraterrestrial environments. This is a view from orbit, uh, but the probes itself, I mean, it's hard to believe. This is Mars, this is another planet, and yet we get these spectacular images. And our probes, when I think of what 
the universe was to me when I was a schoolboy. I mean, Saturn had three rings, nine satellites, which were just points of light. Now we look at it, hundreds of rings. And each of these satellites of Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, have been resolved into individual planets. The, universe, the, the solar system is a far richer place than it was when I was young. And this satellite, Enceladus, uh, we're finding there's water all over the solar system. Where we find liquid water, any place on the Earth we find liquid water, we find life. And so there is this question, are there other places in our solar system where life might exist? Enceladus, a satellite of Saturn, this is a, these are volcanoes made of water. There's liquid water there, there's liquid water on Europa, on Jupiter. This is an artist's conception of what things might look like if you were on the surface of Enceladus, looking back at Saturn through one of these water eruptions. As I say, the, the solar system as well as the universe are far more fascinating places now uh, than they were a generation ago. And we've sent probes. This is the, uh, the Voyager probe, which now has actually, it's in the process of leaving the solar system. It's, it's the first man-made object that is actually flying into interstellar space, and it's still talking to us. So there's tremendous excitement that, that's been going on in both telescopic exploration passively and in our robotic exploration of space. Um, maybe the most exciting thing that's going on, I think, is the search for other planets. This is a dream that astronomers have had for decades. Uh, are there planets around other stars? And if so, how common are they? The Kepler satellite, of course, the first exosolar planet was discovered in 1995, telescopes on the Earth, but we now have the Kepler satellite, which has found thousands of planetary candidates just in the stars near the Earth. And most importantly, we've now started to find planets that are in the so-called habitable zone. This is in our solar system. Uh, the Earth, of course, is in the habitable zone. This is the range where it's not too hot or too cold, but water can exist as a liquid. And we've now started to find planets around other stars. And amazingly, we have found that there are more planets, just by doing the statistics of the stars near us, we now know that there are more planets even than there are stars, which means just in our galaxy there are hundreds of billions of planets and some of them are in the habitable zone with liquid water, so the probability that there is life out there I think is uh, extremely strong and the search for life for planets with atmospheres with, which and, and amazingly, we are now just at the point where we're, we're getting able to measure the chemical composition of the atmospheres of planets around other stars. And if we find free oxygen or ozone, this will be an indication of life. So a lot of excitement in store. Uh, even this uh, planet looks like out of Star Wars. Remember Tatooine with the, uh, the double star? There really is a planet that's going around a double star, very much unexpected. Uh, I want to go now to the future of human spaceflight, uh, which is what I uh, have devoted a large part of my life to. Uh, and we've come a long way since the original space race, which was part of the original Cold War. 1961, the flight of Yuri Gagarin, John Glenn, we won, the cold, uh, we won the space race, we got to the moon. That still is the only body other than the Earth that humans have ever gone to. And then, amazingly, we stopped. But uh, the biggest change, and I think this is what the future holds, is that human spaceflight has become very much international. This is the International Space Station, uh, over 20 countries involved in it, the largest scientific undertaking ever um, put together uh, in human history. Now, of course, the Chinese are the newest uh, entrance to the uh, human space flight. There's Chinese astronauts in orbit uh, at a Chinese space station. You may not appreciate how many countries have actually had people going into space. Um, this gives uh, some idea, well, it's not coming through too clearly 
uh, up there, but you can see it's still the, the U.S. is dominant with Russia sort of in second place. But the, uh, the other thing I, I do have to mention here, uh, you know, in this context, we have had many international astronauts flying both with the Russians and uh, with us at NASA. Uh, they share both the glory and the tragedy. And this is a tribute to Ilan Ramon, who I did get to know while he was at NASA and tragically was lost with the Columbia. He shared the wonder of being in space and then paid the ultimate price coming back. This is something we won't be seeing anymore. The shuttle has been retired. Um, and in the United States, uh, I think the biggest new development, and it's a future which I don't know how it's going to evolve, but there is a generation of billionaires who grew up in the post-Apollo era, and they are space nuts, and they are investing billions of dollars, private money, into the development of private spaceflight. It started with the XPRIZE uh, in the last decade. Paul Allen, Microsoft, um, developed Spaceship One. They won the XPRIZE. Uh, Spaceship One is now hanging in the Smithsonian in a place of honor next to the Spirit of St. Louis and the Bell X-1, which Chuck Yeager used to break the sound barrier. You may recognize the guy on the right, Richard Branson. He figured there's money to be made, so he formed Virgin Galactic. Uh, they're going to take people into space on a short flight. You'll only get about six or seven minutes of weightlessness, and you'll have to pay $200,000, but he already has about 500 people who have signed up, and it's for real. This is Spaceship Two and its trial run, and if you look down here, whoop, this is the uh, Spaceport USA, which is... Uh, almost finished now, being built outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico. There are numerous commercial spaceports being built all over the United States. Uh, Jeff Bezos, Amazon.com. We have half a dozen companies developing this private space flight, and the fascinating thing is this is leading to a lot more innovation than we would have, have gotten. Bob Bigelow, uh, made his fortune in budget motels. He's got a 50% scale model of an inflatable space station already in orbit. And as soon as one of these companies can take people up there, he's going to launch the whole thing. This is kind of a symbolic picture. It's the model of the old space shuttle and Elon Musk's Falcon 9 launching the Dragon capsule up to the International Space Station. So this is possibly the future. Hard to say. Uh, just finishing up, I wanted to say one or two words about robotics in space. Um, we use robotics extensively, both on the shuttle and the International Space Station. We could not have fixed the Hubble Space Telescope without the use of the robotic arm. Um, we've put Robonaut, an anthropomorphic robot, up on the International Space Station. We have these incredible robots that I was talking about already that have been to Mars. The problem is they, they move so slowly. What Spirit and Opportunity have done in seven or eight years, an astronaut could basically do in a long weekend. Getting robots which can operate together with human beings is a huge challenge for future space activities as well as human robotic interactions here on Earth. I don't know how it's going to finally work out, but I do hope that we figure out how to do it. We have this dream someday that humans will once again leave the planet Earth to the moon, eventually to Mars. Uh, it is a new world out there, and I'll just finish. This is the last slide. You all see the sun up there. I don't know if you recognize how unique this view is of the sun. Every time in your life that you have seen the sun, you've seen it in a blue sky because we're here underneath the atmosphere. Here you see the sun the way it truly exists in space. It's a star. It's the nearest star, it's the brightest star, but it's a star in the blackness of space. And this is a perspective which I hope that many more people will be able to have in the future. Thank you.